Uh, about four hours of film, and then we're going to have a dinner, too. Right. Yeah. The city of Vienna. This is the city of Vienna, Austria. Nearly three and a half centuries ago, Vienna, Austria was the site of the last great battle between invading Islamic armies and the defenders of the Christian faith in Europe. The Ottoman Empire had been expanding into Europe for more than 200 years. And wherever Muslim armies went, they plundered cities, took slaves, turned churches into mosques, and converted thousands of Christian captives to Islam at the point of a sword. The goal of these Muslim invaders was to conquer the world in the name of Islam and establish a caliphate to rule over its people with the iron hand of Islamic Sharia law. In 1683, it looked as if the Ottoman Empire was about to conquer Vienna when it was invaded by 140,000 Muslim warriors. The army was led by the ruthless Ottoman Empire's Grand Vizier, Kara Mustafa. The Muslim invaders sieged Vienna on July 16, 1683. Most inhabitants fled the city, with the exception of a small garrison of soldiers and citizen volunteers. It seemed their small numbers would be no match against the attacking Muslim army. But where human numbers failed them, the walls became an impregnable fortress around the city. The only way for the Ottomans to conquer the city was to dig underground tunnels. They hoped to enter the town through the bowels of the earth. On September 11th, relief finally arrived from Poland. A force of 40,000 Poles and their allies counterattacked the Ottoman Turks. And within three hours, the Muslim army fled the battlefield. They abandoned their tents, their weapons, their provisions, and slaves. It was a catastrophic defeat for the Ottoman Empire. It would mark an end to Islam's expansion into the European landscape. It also began a new history of Islamic surrender, decline, and retreat from Europe. But now, three and a half centuries later, a new Islamic invasion is taking place in Europe, and some say this new invasion will end with Europe becoming an Islamic empire, or as some predict, Europe will become the radio. Could it be that Europe, which was once the bastion of Christendom, will soon find itself under the authoritarian rule of Islam? That's the fear of many in Europe. And it's also the full of support of Islamic leaders around the world. The late Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi seemed to give credence to this argument when he said in 2004, there are signs that Allah will grant Islam victory in Europe without swords, without guns, <coughs> without conquests. The 50 million Muslims of Europe will turn it into a Muslim continent within a few decades. How real are these European fears and these threats from Muslim leaders? To find out, our documentary crew traveled throughout Western Europe to get the answers. We interviewed politicians, Muslim leaders, pastors, activists, law enforcement officials, business owners, and ordinary citizens on the streets. What we quickly learned is that far from being a melting pot, Europe is now a battleground <coughs> between two very determined, entrenched, and uncompromising forces. 
Islamic extremists and patriotic Europeans. After three years of investigating, traveling throughout Europe, filming the struggles, victories, and defeats on both sides of this battlefield, it is easy to conclude that what we are witnessing is Europe's last stand. Beginning in the mid-20th century, Europe began inviting Muslim immigrants into their countries to work in coal mines, cotton mills, on railroads, and to clean streets. In reality, the Muslims came to do the jobs that native Europeans were not willing to do. Business leaders and politicians viewed the massive flow of immigrants as a boost to the European economy. But in the early 1970s, the economy of Europe took a turn for the worse and found itself immersed in a crippling oil crisis. Hit hardest were Muslim immigrants. Most became unemployed, and for the next four decades, their economic outlook appeared hopeless. Young Muslims would grow up in Europe feeling betrayed, marginalized, and angry at the host country in which they lived. Anger would turn into betrayal, believing they had nothing in common with native Europeans Many Muslims turned to the internet and satellite television to rediscover their past. What many of them found was a direct path to radical Islam. Well, there's a serious problem with the rise of radicalism in Europe, radical Islam. No doubt about that. Um, poll after poll uh, shows the increasing radicalization of young Muslims uh, in Europe. But despite the desperate and despairing situation of Muslims already living in Europe, many more would come, both legally and illegally. Moroccans and Turks in the Netherlands. Muslims in Norway. North Africans in France. Turks in Germany. Between 1990 and 2009, 26 million Muslims immigrated into Europe, coming from all directions and pouring into every country. Fifth part for both legal and illegal immigration would be Italy, which has 2,500 miles of open coastlines to cross. It's a journey of hardship, confusion, starvation, physical risk, treachery, imprisonment, and even death. One of the most traveled, but also one of the most hazardous entry points into Italy occurs on this small eight square mile island called Lampedusa. Sitting 250 miles off the coastline of mainland Italy, Lampedusa is an Italian tourist resort for summer beachgoers. But for the past two decades, it has also become an attraction to other visitors as well. Unwanted visitors, illegal visitors, Muslims trying to get to Europe from virtually every North African country. Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Morocco, and Nigeria. The small island has so many illegal immigrants trying to reach it that it has been dubbed the gateway to Europe. A monument has even been erected on this small and unassuming island called the Gateway to Europe. Erected seemingly overnight, the monument is dedicated to the thousands of people who died trying to cross the perilous Mediterranean Sea. The dangerous journey begins on the shores of Libya and Tunisia. Muslim men, women, and children are expected to pay a smuggler up to $1,500 per person for the 80-mile voyage. Immigrants are packed in the boats like human sardines, with little or no room for food and water. The boats are barely seaworthy, and many of the voyages are attempted without a captain. If the boat does not capsize, get lost at sea, or run out of fuel, passengers are rescued by the Italian Coast Guard. No one knows exactly how many seafaring immigrants have died during the past two decades, 
Death, however, can be a reasonable expectation due to the decaying, broken down, and worthless fishing vessels used for the journeys. It is even more perilous for the women and children on board. Women and children are reportedly thrown overboard when food and other rations run low, or when overcrowding becomes unbearable. They are also thrown overboard as a callous and gruesome tactic to force the Italian Coast Guard to come to their aid. The continual overflow of Muslim immigrants to the tiny island has threatened to kill its only viable source of revenue, tourism. Many people come in Lampedu, but when start this problem, no come to much people than before. Virtually every illegal arriving on Lampedusa suffers from some form of illness. Dehydration, seasickness, hunger, and dysentery are common ailments among the arrivals. To make matters worse, immigrants are placed in detention centers on Lampedusa that can become overcrowded, unsanitary, and rampant with infectious diseases. In 2011, more than 800 angry immigrants set fire to their holding facility in Lampedusa. After escaping over its balcony walls, they fled throughout the small island. The massive escape caused residents to panic, especially after some of the immigrants threatened to blow up gas canisters. From Lampedusa, the immigrants are transported by ship to holding centers scattered around Italy. From there, immigration officials begin the difficult process of deportation. But it is a process that is rarely successful, especially since immigrants arrive without documents and refuse to disclose their home country. This will be the great question of the years of coming in Italy and Europe. Because in front of a natality very low in Italy, there is a natality very elevated by the people of the Muslim community. So there will be a great increase of people of origin Muslim in Italy and Europe in the coming years. Most of our immigrants um, who are not legal tend to come from Islamic countries from North Africa, a lot come through Spain, they come through the Canary Islands, they come through Italy. Uh, being in the common market, which is now the European Union, we have a lot of porous borders with very little control. People can come in from uh, virtually anywhere. <laughs> France has about 6.5 million Muslims, it has more Muslims than any others. Germany has 3.8 million, most of those happen to be Turkish. Uh, we have a problem that Islam has had massive migration, using it to its advantage. And we have the younger generations that are becoming more radical. Where their parents have come over and have tried to fit in, their offspring, people like the Al Mujahirin group, most of their main leaders are born here and they are more radical than their parents. In the end, due to politics, money, and international pressure, only a handful of illegals are ever returned home. Ci ha sconvolsolato un poco questo fattore clandestino. Allora, prima arrivavano a 20, a 10, a 5. Era tutto tranquillo. E poi, non lo so, è successo che sono arrivate a centinaia. Non so quanto ho voluto, non so quanto è stato, ma è stato molto disastroso. Degli islamici che adesso noi stiamo aiutando, proteggendo, aiutando in tutti i modi, attraverso sovvenzioni, finanziamento, diamo tutti gli aiuti possibili e immaginabili. La casa buoni pasto, no, non pagano ehm, i servizi pubblici, non pagano asili per i bambini, non pagano niente. Now you have all these programs funded by the poor taxpayer all over Europe uh, trying to get these uh, poor Muslims to integrate. You have all these um, language courses paid for by the Austrian government, by the Austrian taxpayer. These people have no interest. It is actually against their religion to integrate. I think that the definition is right, that the United States is a country of dormitory. 
non, non, ha, non ha un indirizzo politico, non, non ha industria, non c'è agricoltura, non c'è un vero e proprio indirizzo turistico, nulla, nulla di questo, quindi è considerato un paese dormitorio, avendo, la, avendo senza la stazione ferroviaria che gli permette a loro di fare la scuola probabilmente senza il Roma, senza pagare il biglietto e senza pagare il biglietto. Although the sheer number of illegal Muslims arriving may overwhelm Italy, most of the immigrants do not make Italy their final destination. Instead, Muslims only enter Italy because it's porous borders and because the rest of Europe is only a high-speed train ride away. Noi sappiamo che molti immigrati clandestini non si vogliono fermare in Italia. Uh, I tunisini e gli algerini vogliono andare in Francia. Gli afghani vogliono andare in Gran Bretagna, uh, i pakistani, molti pakistani vogliono andare in Olanda o in Svezia, dove oltretutto li trattano molto meglio che qui. After the creation of the European Union in 1993, free and unhindered movement became a reality in Western Europe. Europeans can now travel throughout its 28 member states without restricted passports. This enables Muslim immigrants in Italy who are given national residence permits to simply hop on a train. They can then reconnect with relatives and family members in such faraway countries as Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and Germany. What uh, most people need to realize is that the European Union uh, has now become a real union just like in the United States, different states, different nations, but you do not need anymore a passport. There is no more borders between Italy and France, France and Germany, uh, France and the UK, Ireland and so on. So all the European nations, they are all connected and you just take the car and go right across. You take the train and you go right across. So once that you are in Italy, you are practically in every other nation in Europe. But immigration is not the only form of invasion among Muslims attempting to besiege Europe. Another group of mass Muslim arrivals comes in the form of asylum seekers and family reunification programs. In recent years, millions of asylum seekers have illegally entered Europe seeking refugee status. The dramatic increase over previous decades has been fueled by a multi-billion dollar a year business of human traffickers. Though not all refugees come from Muslim countries, many do arrive from Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and North African nations. The number of asylum seekers arriving in the EU member states in 2011 increased by an astounding 325% over 2010, with most refugees seeking residence in Germany, France, Belgium, and Italy. Beyond asylum seekers, Muslims have also poured into Western Europe through family reunification programs. These programs allow Muslim families in foreign countries to reunite with their relatives in Western Europe. The program allows for spouses, children, fiancés, dependents of students, and even the dependents of asylum seekers to apply for family reunification. Well, in the 1960s, we had uh, something like 80,000 Muslims in Britain. And They've been growing roughly uh, doubling every decade. So by the time we got to 1990, we had a million. By 2000, two million. Uh, by 2010, somewhere between three and four million. So it's, uh, you know, you push that forward, of course, and you're suddenly looking at six million, 12 million, 24 million, if they continue as they are. And family reunification comes into it, uh, because they can, uh, they can send home for wives, up to four, of course, and they come over, have plenty of children, as we know now. The flow of Muslim immigrants, asylum seekers, and the practice of family reunification programs are three paths of Islamic growth in Europe. But a fourth path, which some claim may be the most challenging, comes in the form of Muslim birth rates. The internet is flowing with doomsday accounts of Muslim population growth in Europe. These fears are driven by a number of factors, including the Muslim practice of polygamous marriages and their religious ban against abortion and contraceptives. In 2009, a video surfaced on the internet that sent shockwaves throughout the West and became a worldwide sensation. Titled, Muslims are taking over the world. 
The video has been seen by more than 14 million viewers. The filmmaker dramatically contrasts the low fertility rate of non-Muslims with that of Muslim families. In a matter of years, the film warns, Europe as we know it will cease to exist. According to the video, Muslims are having 8.1 children per family in France, while in the Netherlands, 50% of all newborns are Muslim. With 52 million Muslims now living in Europe, the film predicts that this number will double in the next 20 years. The producers call upon its viewers to wake up, claiming this is a call to action. The evidence behind this alarming video have been debated and disputed by scores of demographers, population experts, and even conservative think tanks. In the end, the true facts of Muslim birth rates in Europe may never be known. That's because the European Union bars questions of religious identity from its surveys. To conquer Europe, Islam does not need to outnumber its opponents. It simply needs to have an organizational structure for the community known as the Ummah to follow. And that structure is best known by examining the second pillar of radical Islam, Imams. Few in Europe were ever aware of radical Islam before February 14, 1989. That's the date Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran issued a death fatwa against a British Indian novelist, Sir Ahmed Salman Rushdie. Rushdie had written a fictional novel called The Satanic Verses. The book's title refers to certain Quranic verses that allow for prayers to be made by pagan goddesses. Its publication caused an immediate uprising in the Islamic world. Nearly the entire Muslim population considered the book's contents blasphemous to the Prophet Muhammad. Ayatollah Ali Hamanai has repeated the death sentence against the author Salman Rushdie. They were, you know, it wasn't just a question of burning books and burning little scroll effigies in Hyde Park. That alone shocked people. But for them to call for the death of somebody, and I think the British political establishment should then have stood up and they should have done something about it there and then. They should have made a move. People who were inciting murder, which is against the law, should have been prosecuted. In major cities across England, angry and violent demonstrations broke out. And for the first time in centuries, Britain witnessed books being burned on its streets. One Labour Party member even demanded that the satanic verses be banned. In other parts of the world, riots erupted. Translators and publishers were assaulted, injured, knifed, shot, and killed. Bookstores were firebombed, and embassies were forced to be closed. Even folk singer Cass Stevens, who now calls himself Yusuf Islam, went on British television and called for the death of Rushdie. Europeans would quickly learn that extreme Islam was not exclusive to such faraway Muslim countries as Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Egypt, or Saudi Arabia. Radical Islam was now on their streets, in their mosques, in their communities, and arriving daily through their open borders. You know what we say? Your British system can go to hell! In the years following the Rushdie riots, Europeans began witnessing an ever-increasing presence of women wearing burqas, halal food in their shops, Muslims taking over streets for prayer services, and demands for Islamic law and Sharia compliance. The surge of Islamic extremism across Europe has given growth to numerous opposition groups. There are now demands for an end to the building of new mosques, for the deportation of Muslim extremists, for the passage of strict immigration laws, for the banning of burqas, and for the rejection of any type of Sharia concessions. What Europeans fear most about Islam are the extremists. And while there are questions about how many Islamic radicals live in Europe, there is no question about who is doing the radicalization. Imams. Imams are the spiritual <coughs> leaders of the Sunni branch of Islam, which dominates Europe. They are teachers and prayer leaders of the Muslim faithful. In Europe, most trained imams come from overseas. 
Some of these imams are considered moderate, such as those arriving out of Turkey and Jordan. But most are considered hardline fundamentalist, such as those coming from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Egypt. These imams hold harsh religious views on the treatment of women and homosexuals. They support blasphemy laws, which allow severe punishment, even death, for insulting Islam. They enact bans on alcohol and contraception, and they routinely attack Western culture, its freedoms, and democracy. Currently, there are over 6,000 mosques in Europe, with hundreds of new ones being built each year. In 2013, France alone witnessed over 150 new mosques under construction. And with each passing year, new mosques grow larger, become more lavish, more grandeur, and reach higher into the skyline. Many are now being built as mega mosques that can seat over 12,000 worshippers. Though strident Islam is taught in virtually every mosque, big or small, Self-proclaimed imams, meaning those without any formal training, teach the most extremist Islam. These self-proclaimed imams operate in the thousands of small and unassuming cottage mosques throughout Europe, such as in bookstores, abandoned warehouses, apartment buildings, and even abandoned churches. <coughs> a solo mosque is like a normal mosque is a big building built to be a mosque. A solo mosque is phenomenon where they just take an ordinary cellar or an apartment that it wasn't built for for having sermons in it, but they use it anyway as a mosque. That, that's what we call a cellar mosque. The arming uh, oneself is, uh, is done through uh, mosques. Uh, this is another thing uh, the public doesn't know, uh, which I tell them all the time whenever I can, that uh, the mosque is a multitask uh, institution. First of all, the so-called prayer. Secondly, it's um, through the, at the beginning, uh, mentioned Friday prayer, uh, the political indoctrination. Thirdly, it's uh, marriage market. Fourthly, it's uh, the place where you plan uh, war action or strategic action, I mean, below war levels, right? And fifthly, it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, uh, you, it's a storage uh, place for what stuff. Among the most well-known and controversial self-proclaimed imams are Abu Imran, the leader of Sharia for Belgium, and Andrum Chowdhury, the leader of Islam for UK. Both have a large internet following and guide thousands of European Muslims in their plan to implement Sharia law in the West and to topple the government. Anyone could also start there again. a pretty gruesome bunch there. Oh, yeah. oh it gets worse. There's two, there's two parts to that story. Uh, that, uh, Lord have mercy. That's, that's what they want to do here. I know. Isn't there a group called the Gates of Vienna? Part of that Act for America. Um, I remembered when it happened back in the... You see them coming over the side of buildings, they look like human cockroaches, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Well, I served in the Coast Guard, and I seen them coming off those boats. Like, it's just like the Haitians did back in the 80s. And they overran Miami, but the Haitians weren't... you got to get ready for the broadcast the now. Oh, well, he left already. I'm taking Jim's car. Oh, I'm going to okay. drop coupon off. Cause, uh, now, do you listen on the cell phone in the afternoon or at night? Uh, afternoon, 3 o'clock. Three o'clock? He's going to be on 3 to 4 on the leading okay. end. And you can, I'm, and you can uh, listen to the program over your cell phone. Down We're right. lucky out here because we can listen to them from 1 to 3 on the rebroadcast. Yes. Is yeah. it the same program or a different no, one? No, it's a different program. Mm -hmm. If he'll do a different program. Uh, and it's only but if you're on the computer, you can get it on, you know, right. if you've got an internet connection, you get log on to leadingedge.com. But the cell phone will be good. He's on an edge right around. before pasture. Okay. Uh, he's on. Uh, I think it's on for two hours. I think it comes on at one o'clock. So you should be able to listen to him through the same number. They got, I don't know how many lines go in, but there's a whole bunch of people that could call in and listen to the program, you know, over their cell phone. So. 
Is it already started, or is it start Monday? Yes, uh, I think they started last night. Did they really? Because uh, I, I logged on. He was on at least two of the two of the yeah. two of the channels on there. He's huh. supposed to be on the third. So wow. they got he's got three different channels on the leading edge. You look okay, a little sure. weary tonight. A little weary. Yeah. Had a long day. Uh, cook men's prayer breakfast. I usually get up about five thirty. So. Thursdays are long days. That's why I was uh, happy to uh, take Jim's car and uh, not not go to because if we had to take coupon back home, it would be one thirty in the morning before really? we finally get back and go to bed. You live around here, don't you, Ken? Or you live no, in I live in Middlefield. 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 Yep. Oh my. It's better than being downtown Cleveland, I'll take guarantee you that. <laughs> well, yeah. Did you get out of the hospital? Uh, uh, last night. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, my goodness. Yes. Yes. They had me in the hospital night. again. I, I appreciate your prayers and all the good things can you guys do. Can I help yeah. 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 these yeah. out? Sure. Sure. Thursday, yeah. I'm just going to go down there and get a hamburger if you guys want some stuff done. Which one? The one all the way down Elm? Yeah. 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 That sounds like a good idea, actually. Yeah. So you, you brought Are you going? Oh, probably. Yeah. Uh, no, we got uh, one of his neighbors brought him home. Well, you're looking sure. good, coupon. Well, thank you. I'm still on the side of the grass. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So still I've got, I got to keep praying about got, getting the right. Uh, still got everything done. Um, so. Yeah, the right we're stuff down here. What is nutrients. Now nah, nah, I think we're just going to go the other way. It, uh, so is there I guess a, I'm tired. I'm is there a phone number somebody in Virginia could call to listen to Pastor Ernie? Be the same, wouldn't it? Uh, on the leading edge, yeah, it'd be the same number. Uh, yeah, that whatever that number was. Oh. Did you copy that? I wrote it down. No. I wrote it down. Yeah, I wrote it down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we got to see Deborah tonight. Yay! Oh, I've been missing hey. you. I know. You afraid you guys get stuff done on Wednesdays? Get something? I don't know. I'll we'll be down there if you do. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to shut everything down. Yeah, I had so much better internet connection here than I do. I've been having all kinds of trouble. <laughs> well, here it just comes from uh, Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen, yeah. But their, their uh, signal is much better on the Wi-Fi they, than and they leave, they, what they, I'm able to get where I'm they, at. They leave their connection on even when they close in the winter. Yeah, I, th I appreciate that too. Yeah, let me have some light work and see what I'm finishing. Oh my! Try to pack it up here. The, uh, I didn't turn the. Uh, oh, I gotta turn this off. We're recording 